Again, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending our webinar. Uh, today's subject is the permeation basics. It's the core of what we do here at our company. And it's a very meaningful uh, test method uh, that, that we work at. Just to start out with permeation basics, uh, we like to just talk about packaging in general. So whether you're, you're working with uh, food, lotions, uh, medical devices, electronics, uh, things like solar panels or these flat OLED screens, uh, permeation is very important to the shelf life or the usable life of many of the products inside. All right. All right. The purpose of, of packaging itself is multifold. Uh, in ge very generically, um, it's designed to contain uh, and enclose a product. The overall goal is to provide a consistent barrier between the product and the environment surrounding it. Um, it can, if, if for protective purposes, you may be looking at keeping things outside of it. If you've got some, a product inside that could be sensitive to humidity, um, then you want a good barrier that keeps water vapor out. Uh, or maybe you've got things inside your packaging, maybe like essential oils or active ingredients, and you want to keep them contained and inside to keep your product within specifications. So overall, when we look at barrier packaging, we're looking at uh, things coming from two directions, either from inside the package going out or outside the package coming in. And it's a very real life situation because you might be having a product that is put on a shelf uh, next to another product. Uh, for example, a convenience store. If someone has a laundry detergent, if they're going to put it on a shelf next to a bottle of water, some of those those aromas from laundry detergent could permeate through to the water and give you a bad taste or flavor. Here's an example I like to put up right away when I talk about permeation. Uh, it's your classic two liter bottle of uh, carbonated soft drink. In this situation, you pressurize it with CO2, and, and CO2 is very important to the flavor profile of a carbonated soft drink. And I think we've all tasted maybe a, a soda pop that went bad or went flat or went stale. Many people think that a lot of the CO2 loss is through the closure at the top of the bottle. In fact, the majority of the loss is really through the bottle sidewall. So one thing to keep in mind is that CO2 does leave. It's concentrated to a large extent inside the bottle, and there's, very, there's a relatively smaller amount of CO2 in the atmosphere around it, roughly 400 ppm. That provides what we call driving force. So CO2 wants to leave the area of high concentration and move out of a bottle. Likewise, when you fill a bottle like this, you've got, let's see, you've got room air around it. Well, that room air oxygen uh, it still wants to permeate in and come to equilibrium with the oxygen environment around it. And a lot of people just don't realize that even though I have a highly pressurized system here, oxygen is at a low concentration on this side when it's inside the bottle. So it will still want to move in here. So this is a great example, I think, of talking about how permeation really is a two-way street. And the ultimate goal is to come to equilibrium, to be at a, at, a, at a very level concentration on both sides of a packaging material. The mechanism for permeation is really it's a three-part uh, step. We've got molecules that are going to be on one side. In this situation, we've got a package wall. We've got environment around it. We've got a product inside. Let's say we're looking at water vapor uh, coming into a dry product. Well, the humidity in the environment uh, will want to first uh, reach uh, the package wall, absorb into it, and then desorb out of it into the product. A couple things to note here is that, again, the overall goal is for our permeant, in this case I'm saying it's water vapor, to come to equilibrium on both sides. Uh, one way that we count molecules is by pressure. So this high concentration of, of, of molecules, we say it is a partial pressure or a high pressure, and this side we'll say is a low pressure. So within the uh, nuances or vocabulary of permeation, we discuss this with partial pressure and driving forces. Those are the common terms that you'll hear within people who talk about the measurements that we make. I get often asked, you know, what does permeation look like? Well, in the previous example, I talked about in molecules, these water vapor molecules, moving into a package of wall, being absorbed into it, and then coming out on the other side. So when you start a test, 
let's say that our material was totally void of that of the water vapor to start with, you're not going to see anything come through on the other side. And this graph is actually an example of what we measure on that other side or in the case of the dry package on the inside of that bottle. And what you'll see is it comes up slowly and then over time we got an equilibrium level. And that's what we're normally measuring is that equilibrium level which is concern. So it's very common to see this uptake curve to reach equilibrium. There's other examples of permeation. For example, if we're looking at oxygen coming into a bottle, maybe there was already pre-absorbed oxygen within that wall. So instead of this classical uptake curve, you might have now seen it come down a little bit as we're purging with nitrogen and then have it come up. And I'll explain that in a few more slides. One thing I like to discuss early on is that there are interactions between the permeate and the polymer. Uh, and because of that, when you measure an oxygen transmission rate for one material type, it doesn't hold for all material types. For example, I've got here of oxygen permeation rate through PET versus high density polyethylene. Now it's classically known that, yeah, PET is a better barrier than high density polyethylene. And this really indicates that it's more than 20 times better when normalized here. So that's a good thing to know. But something some, you know, people don't always understand is that these different gases also behave differently too. So in the case of high density polyethylene, if I look at oxygen versus nitrogen, nitrogen is lower. Whereas carbon dioxide, CO2, is much higher. Now some people might think that seems awfully weird because CO2 is a carbon plus two oxygens. It's actually the larger molecule. So how can a larger molecule fit through and go through actually at a faster rate or a higher rate than oxygen? That's a good question. And I will get into that. But definitely one thing I want you to understand or to take away is that there's not one given rule, again, how one gas behaves with all polymers or even within one polymer type how all gases behave. And we really, at I ad advocates of if you have an interest within a very specific gas or a very specific type that you measure it to understand really what is that permeation rate. Now someone may ask, well geez, why would I want to know all of these, these types of gases? And a practical example is coffee. I, when coffee is roasted, um, it gives off CO2. It's, it's, it's combustion, it's burning and things like that. In fact, after the roasting process, when it's pulled out of the oven, it is still roasting a little bit. We also know for coffee, for its shelf life, that oxygen affects it in a bad way. It can make it taste more stale or flat. So if you're packaging coffee, some things you may do is want a good oxygen barrier of your, of your, of your package. And you'll see foil used a lot. You may want to, when you package it as well, you may want to do a modified atmosphere package where you flush it with nitrogen to get any room or ambient oxygen out of it. So you may be interested in keeping that nitrogen inside once you flush it out. And then if CO2 is absorbed within these beans and they're still coming out, um, then you've got to be curious about how can I get CO2 maybe out of my package before it might explode. In fact, in a practical nature, when you look at coffee bags, they are foil to keep that oxygen out. Uh, they do use modified atmospheres at times. And they actually put a one-way valve in to try to keep that pressurization from occurring. So I like the, the, the example of coffee in this situation. And as I talked about how that CO2 was absorbed in the coffee, it actually makes a nice segue into solubility. Solubility is the amount of, of a gas that can be absorbed within a, a packaging material. It can be in a solid, it can be in a liquid, but normally you think of it in a packaging material. And personally, I like to think of it as a sponge, because the reality is how much does it hold? And the units of solubility tend to be a volume of gas per volume of material, or it could even be a weight, a uh, weight of gas per weight of material. And often you think of solubility can be measured pretty easily um, in the case of water vapor just by having a saturated polymer in a known humidity and then drying it out and weighing again. And the weight loss was that amount of grams or how much water was absorbed in the structure. Some things to consider is that over time, or actually over temperature, solubility is tied to temperature. In fact, as temperatures increase, solubility drops. 
And that kind of intuitively makes sense, that if you want to dry something out, you increase the temperature. Um, and in this case, I'm looking at solubility in water. So if you, if you, if you make a, uh, if you look, reduce the temperature of water, you can fit more gas within it. All right. One thing about solubility, I talked about water vapor and how you can measure the solubility of wa water within a polymer. How would you measure the solubility of oxygen is one good question. And why would you be curious about it? One example here is a two liter soda pop bottle. And we've done tests here to prove that it can contain roughly half a milliliter of oxygen within its structure. Now for soda pop, that doesn't really matter so much. But if someone is maybe engineering a new polymer or trying to transition their product from glass to a, to a plastic or a polymer, let's say a syringe or a vial, maybe the amount of oxygen that's absorbed within the, the package itself could be detrimental to the product inside. We've seen cases where people want to take, when they, when they transition from a glass to a polymer, and they'll say, I'm going to put a foil pouch around it. I'm going to encase it. Therefore, my room oxygen can't get in here. However, they may forget that there's a certain amount absorbed within the structure. Now, measuring solubility within a polymer can be kind of tricky. There's a technique that we can use here where we, we take a sample, we saturate it in a known environment. It could be room air at a known temperature. And then what we'll do is we'll actually outgas the sample and capture the oxygen coming out. Just as I discussed, a water vapor test where you measure the, the, the grams of water coming out. Here I'm measuring the cc's of oxygen coming out. I can integrate that curve and come up with how much was in here. It's a nice little, it's a nice tool that we have that helps people when they're transitioning from glasses to polymer. Diffusion is another innate material property uh, within polymers. And what we're talking about is how gases move through it. So now we're actually bringing a movement context into, into the equation here. The solubility is how much does it hold. Diffusion is how quickly do things move through it. In this example, we're showing how things in the environment around are going to wiggle and come in here. It's a random motion. Uh, it was first described uh, or thought of and rules around it by a, a gentleman by the name of, of Fick who was doing research on diffusion of salts within liquids. And, it, and his reasoning actually applies across broader categories than just liquids. It goes within solids, within uh, other gases as well. And what he came up is fixed first law. And it says this flux, or the flow of gas, is dependent upon this diffusion coefficient times the concentration over the, the thickness of the material. And this is, is really, really true. And what we look at this, we look at the flux of gas, and try to think of practical terms, is that the concentration now is how much gas is around it. And the material thickness is, is how far it has to diffuse through. And in real terms, if I use a higher concentration, so if I'm looking at 100% RH versus 50% RH, I'm going to get more flux. Likewise, if I have a thicker sample, uh, you know, then because the thickness is here in the denominator, it's going to cut my flux in half. Uh, one thing to talk about diffusion is, is that it ties very closely with temperature, meaning that Higher temperature means more energy and the faster these molecules move. And then therefore diffusion increases with temperature. Permeability is the product of the two, diffusion times solubility. And this is a very common thing that we, we see within uh, our, in, our niche of industry. So understanding these two uh, properties really tells us about overall permeation. Another way to look at this is we have this equation here that talks about the quantity of permeant. Uh, through a thickness of polymer. A delta P is our pressure differential. When I talk about inside and outside of a package, how those molecules are moving. And uh, we've got an area that you're moving through in time. So this really brings a time element uh, to our calculation. So what I talked about earlier is as temperature increases, we saw solubility drop. As temperature increases, diffusion increases. And these are solubility and diffusion are products of the two. So what happens when you multiply them too, and how, what does that impact on permeation? Well, overall, diffusion really overrides solubility, and it increases quite dramatically. So there's a good school of thought that for about every 10 C change in temperature, that your transmission rates or your permeation rates will increase, or they will double. 
and that actually follows something called an Arrhenius equation. It's used a lot in chemistry that if you want your chemistry to happen quicker or sooner, you increase your temperature. Here's an example of just some data on polyethylene that was been tabulated and looking at different permeates. You can see that when you increase the temperature, yes indeed, the transmission rates do increase quite dramatically. One thing we talk about with temperature, I think is kind of important, is multi-temperature studies. I mentioned as they increase, intensity increase, doubles transmission rate, actually fits something called an Arrhenius equation. And here's an example of Arrhenius equation. We say a permeation rate is equal to a base permeation rate. Um, and then we've got activation energy, gas um, constant, and temperature. A practical application of that would be if you're going to do a temperature study of a polymer, let's say you do it at 40C, 20C, 10C, and you get these transmission rate or permeation rate data, and someone comes back to you later and says, what do you think the permeation rate is going to be at 30C? Well, you can do a graph, it's called an Arrhenius plot, where we look at the log of permeation or log of transmission rate versus 1 over degree Kelvin, you can get a linear fit. And if it is a linear fit, you can now predict 30C, 25C, and all those points in between. One thing to be aware of is if you do go this far and do, uh, you know, and try to do a lot of predicting, is that many materials go through what is called a glass transition. It goes through a material change. You can think as it heats up, it might get rubbery, or it could change crystallinity. And if you go through a physical material change, odds are likely that the permeation is going to be impacted. Maybe the diffusion coefficient changes with that, tra with that transition. So something to be aware of is when you are using Arrhenius plots to calculate or estimate other temperatures, that you don't go too far, or at least you've got some other indication that the material does withstand those temperatures very well without going through phase or glass transitions. All right, so kind of to re-round up on some of these thoughts and how they work in a practical application. I just want to demonstrate here bottles being tested. And they're the same type of bottles. Now that they're being tested at our ambient environment with room air, 20.9% used on one of them. And the other one, we bag it and we pump in 100% oxygen. And how do we know it's 100% oxygen? Well, if any of our equipment, we always use a headspace analyzer to verify our test conditions as well. And what we find out is that using 100% oxygen means more molecules on the outside of this package as it permeates into the bottle. And this bottle set up so internally nitrogen is purging in here. So any oxygen that goes inside gets swept out and brought to our instrument where we analyze it. Well, with 100% oxygen, we do get a higher transmission rate, roughly five times, like 4.78 times. Again, this is real numbers. So this is a coating on a bottle, so it may not be exactly um, that ratio between 120.9%, but it definitely shows a large increase when you use more oxygen. Like one question is, as many people believe, if I use more oxygen, I can make the test go quicker. But when I talked about solubility and I talked about concentrations, there was nothing really about temperature. Temperature was tied to diffusion. And what happens is, is that using more oxygen still required four days to reach equilibrium. That's one takeaway that I'd like, like you to have, is that even using a higher concentration of gas doesn't make the test go quicker. It gives us a larger value, and when you're testing high barrier samples, those are better numbers when you get further away from, from the noise or a low level. Units. Uh, we see a lot of units around uh, transmission rate. Um, just initially, we've got a quantity of gas over area versus time. This is innately what we measure. Uh, when we're testing a bottle or a material or a film. Uh, the units could be cc's, it could be grams, the area could be meters squared, 100 inch squared. Time is normally days, but it could be seconds or minutes as well. And this is a very practical term. Uh, you'll see other things in literature maybe where they divide by that pressure, or the driving force to normalize things out. This is a nice way to, to if someone did testing with 100% oxygen versus room air, you can normalize the results out to say, yes, my two bottles are the same. It's a, it's a neat thing to do. Um, I do caution people that if they're doing this with humidity, there are some materials where if you test with 100% humidity, and think of like a coated paper, that paper may break down. Where if someone else tests with 50% RH, so when a paper breaks down or it changes, 
with that concentration or the pressure, in this case the humidity increase, then it's, a, it's called non-Fickian. And really normalizing to the vapor pressure isn't probably an accurate thing to do. I would still personally report transmission rate and the test conditions that I used uh, to get those results. Ultimately, at the end, if you normalize to that, that pressure differential, and if you normalize to a thickness of a material, you get what we call the permeability coefficient. And this is an innate uh, characteristic or innate measurement of a polymer type. So you'll see a lot of books where you'll find PET, polyethylene, and even I referenced them earlier in an earlier slide of permeability coefficients. And it's a great way to characterize what material is better than, than another material. Or another practical use is to try to use this uh, to figure out how to design or engineer a certain package that I want, given a barrier uh, that I may need. An example of this um, is that I'm going to just set up a quick uh, example. Is, let's say there's a product that's being put within a package. And it's 500 grams of that product. And some scientists did some work to find out that 0.05% oxygen weight weight means of oxygen within the product creates the product to be at its end of usable life. So we know how much oxygen now can contain before it's bad. The package itself will be put in something that has 400 centimeters squared surface area, storage condition 25C, 60% RH, and a desired shelf life of six months. So the question is, can we calculate the minimum thickness for a PET package given all of these constraints? And the answer is yes, you can do it. I showed you before where we looked at a, uh, a flux coming through in an equation. Um, I did the P equals S times D. I, and then, then there was an equation next to it. I just rearranged that equation and substitute and isolated the, the thickness or the path length. And there's things that we had to look up. We had to find the permeation measurement for PET at 25C with humidity. We've got a time element here of six months, 180 days. We've got an area element. And we've got differential pressure. So if we're saying it's room air, 0.21 atmospheres, we can convert that into kilopascals. So what we're looking at is Q for that flux can now be calculated out. And we see to, to get to that level of 0.05% weight, weight of oxygen in this, it actually requires 17.5 cc's of oxygen in ingress over time. So we did this. Now we go back, we plug it all in. And then we can get a result at the end of the day of 7.6 mils is probably the minimum thickness that we want for the shelf life of the product we need. That's a practical example of how you would use those, those values. Uh, I will caution you, however, when you, when you do that, they're estimates. They're good ballparks. When you process something, you may process it in a way that it has a different crystallinity. So its true permeation rate would be different than what you estimate it to be. Uh, also, product can, or packaging can go under wear and tear. It could have seals. It could have other areas. But this is a good way to understand how should I engineer something, or at least give you a good ballpark to start with. And then once you make that packaging, come back and test it to see did you get the barrier that you needed. Another a factor that can affect permeation is relative humidity. There are some materials, and this is an older slide, but it, I think it does a great job to show how humidity can impact a transmission rate. This example of nylon, I've tested this myself, where when it's very dry, it's a higher transmitter. Then as you get to a moderate humidity, it actually becomes a little bit of a better barrier. Then as you get into higher humidities, it becomes a worse barrier. In this case, the material can swell, it can change in the presence of humidity, and it affects the oxygen transmission rate. So it's important to know that humidity can affect certain polymers, other polymers, not all polymers, but certain polymers. So when you are designing a test, you should understand the environment that you're going to be putting it into. So if you're, if you're packaging a wet product, maybe this nylon 6 wouldn't be good. Or, or so you need to understand the conditions of your product, what that will put on your packaging, but also the environment that it will go into. Uh, and the last thing is, is that when you're trying to look at the permeation or transmission rate data, understand how it was tested. Was it tested with the humidity that you need and at the temperatures that you require? 
Um, this is also good information. It says, geez, if EVOH or, or some of these things are really sensitive to humidity, maybe what can I do? Can I put some barrier structures around them to protect them from humidity? And that's often done. You'll see a lot of these materials put within multi-layered structures. Another thing I like to talk about for permeation is time. Um, this is an example of a metallized film. It was tested by one lab for six hours. It was kind of their QA check. It was a relatively high transmitter. It came up very quickly, relatively stable. However, it tested at another lab where they're using a criteria of trying to find a, a nice steady value over 24, whoops, over 24 hours. This, test, this lab let the test run longer. Uh, and this was a metallized film. And it's suspected that really that metallization once the, uh, it was affected by, by the humidity of the test, or maybe the substrate swelled a little bit, cracked the, cracked the metallization, we don't exactly know. But we know that it was affected by humidity. So in some materials, when you look at the data, I've already talked about knowing the temperature and knowing the humidity of the test. But understanding what the criteria was for the test to be, to be declared done uh, is also important, too. Uh, we tend to look at a 24-hour criteria, looking for things to be stable, uh, where other people, maybe not so much. And to be honest, a lot of the ASTM methods are left very open or vague, just saying, you know, if you have two repeatable results or three repeatable results, that you can call the test done. So a lot of it is, is internal lab interpretation on uh, what you're going to call uh, equilibrium. Something else that can influence permeation, um, additives that you put into into your material. In this case, here was a uh, PVC that's rigid versus plasticized. And kind of innately, you think, hey, if it's rubbery, it's plasticized, I can get more through it. This is very true. So in this case, the additive made a higher transmission rate. It's very common, or it's been commonly known, a lot of people put these nano components and nanoparticles into their structures to make better barriers. And that can work as well. I do caution people that once, when you do that, to affect the permeation properties, you're probably already affecting other mechanical properties. So maybe if you load a lot of additives into it, or clays and things like that, you may have a narrow window to actually work with, um, to work with uh, processing. The chemistry itself, I talked initially about polyethylene and PET at the very beginning. But here's an example where we start with two carbon bonds, and what we add to them greatly impacts the oxygen permeation rate. You can see when we get to something very highly polar, like chlorine, we can really keep oxygen out. So understanding that it's not just as simple if I add one structure here, what happens to it, you have to understand the chemistry of the interaction between the polymers and the permeates. Material thickness. I like to put this up there because both these bottles are made on PET. Here's your standard water bottle, which can be kind of thin. You can crush them quite, quite easily. Whereas for a juice bottle, it's made much thicker. The reasoning for that is the juice bottle itself will have some vitamins within it. And if oxygen permeates in, it can degrade those vitamins and put it out of specs. So one thing to understand is thinner samples will transmit more oxygen at higher levels than thicker samples. And this is a pretty, pretty good generality that works for most structures. I've seen some coatings where some special things were done to create more cross-linking in a thin structure. But for bulk polymer analysis, if you're thinner, you're going to have a higher transmission rate in the same material. One thing to take away, though, is when you double the thickness or you make samples thicker, you do increase the barrier. But if you're testing them, the time to test can take much, much longer. And the, and the general rule, and it's very real, is that when you double a material thickness, you can take four times longer to reach equilibrium. So when I showed you that graph, that uptake curve of what permeation looks like, one of the things I forgot to explain is that this mechanism can occur in hours, days, or weeks. It all depends on the polymer that you're looking at. And it's something that you really don't know until you start the testing. So material thickness definitely does play a role into our permeation measurements. Multi-layered structures. Maybe you've got polyethylene, you've got metallization, you've got some tie layers. How do you handle this? Well, you can measure bulk permeation through it very easily, or I should say bulk transmission rate through it very easily. Uh, but solubility becomes harder to measure because each of these will have its own innate properties. However, if you've got materials that obey what we call fixed laws, 
uh, you can mathematically add them together. It's something called material uh, parallel resistance. So if I've got a total material here, of A plus B plus C, and this could be a, a, a polyethylene with, uh, I, don't know, I don't know, PET is another polyethylene. I don't know why you'd make that structure, but you can do it. If you, if you want to know what the total transmission rate is through it, if you know the, the, the innate transmission rates or permeation rates of each piece, they can be added together. And this is another tool that's used when you're looking at engineering materials uh, for initial design or for initial structure. You get asked, how do you measure films for testing? This is an example of our diffusion cell on the outside, this gray here. This middle gray area would be the material that we're trying to test. And what we do is we set it up with a test gas that flows on one side. In this case, it shows oxygen. And on this side, we have a different gas. And we're trying to, any oxygen molecules that come here, we sweep them away. So we always have that concentration gradient of high oxygen on one side, low oxygen on the other, which makes the oxygen move through here. Uh, it's very important that if you have moisture sensitive or humidity sensitive structures, that you can add humidity to your oxygen or to your nitrogen to simulate a real life environment. It's also important that you control your temperature very well. Because if I talked about how 10 degrees C can make things double in transmission rate, 1 degree C can make things change 4 to 6 percent. So to have good repeatability in your results, it's important to have a good setup overall as well. So in this case, any oxygen that permeates through, swept by the nitrogen to carrier gas to our coolometric or cool ox detector where we quantify it. So we talked about temperature, we talked about humidity. And one of the things I like to talk, that I discuss with clients if they're interested in testing is how do you want to test it? What temperatures do you want? Do you want a refrigerated temperature where something may be stored, something more ambient, or something more tropical or a warehouse environment? That's important to note. I'll give you a great example is if someone is packaging something that should be refrigerated, it could be a serum, or let's think of maybe like cheese. If I'm packaging cheese and I want to keep my humidity level constant within the packaging, I want to have a nice barrier around it just to keep the water vapor inside. So if I'm going to look at test for cheese packaging, would I test at 100 degrees Fahrenheit? Probably not. However, 100 degrees Fahrenheit is the most common test condition for water vapor transmission rate. So you can approach this two ways. You can look at you know, materials, how they compare to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, or you could cool it down to a real life, real life level and test at those conditions. And what's important is if you can test at those conditions, at those refrigerated conditions, then you can use those numbers for real life, shelf life estimates to see how long will my product be good and how fast will it dry out in this case. Okay. Well, another thing to consider is the packaging itself. It will undergo wear and tear as processing, but it undergoes a lot of wear and tear through transportation. You know, is it going to be packed in boxes, gone in pallets, put in containers and shipped? Could it go in airfare? Is it going to have shock and vibration due to transportation? I'll say right now that a, a pouch uh, that you that I'm provided that's a pristine structure, maybe it hasn't even been filled yet, will give a larger or a much different transmission rate than one that's gone through real life wear and tear. Uh, think of a, a vacuum sealed pouch with all the creasing and crinkling and, and that kind of um, environment that it goes through it may not actually be performed the same as a pristine structure. So if you still want to look at film samples, you can cut them, but cut them from one that's gone through real life distribution, and you'll get more meaningful numbers is my, my thoughts there. Um, trans, I'm going to trans, translate over to a little bit from film testing, which I just showed you, to package testing. Very easily, we've got packages here. I've got a bottle. We mount it to a plate. I kind of showed you that test before. We've got oxygen on the outside, nitrogen purging on the inside, we, and any oxygen that permeates through, we bring out to our instrument and detect it and quantify it. So full packages are also very meaningful to test because you get to understand how do seams, how do seals, how do closures, how do they all fit together in the overall protection of my product. And a good example of this was some testing we did uh, on small pouches. We looked at the base material themselves, it was a foil pouch, it was very good, 
and everything said because it was foil that we should get great barrier out of our pouches. When we tested the pouches, we actually had very measurable transmission rates. It was quite a surprise because we, our client here needed a good barrier. If we look at the pouch itself, you can see, it, you know what, it has really great seals. They're sealed very well, very hard. The material itself is a good foil. Where could this transmission rate be coming from? Well, in fact, when we do a closer inspection at those seals, we put a light behind it. You can see some pinholing here uh, along, this, along this seal here. You can see light coming through. And really what happens is, is that during the sealing structure, the foil got compromised. And so the foil layers might be broken a little bit. The, the package itself had good seal integrity. I mean, a good package integrity. There are no actual through holes or pinholes in the packaging. But if light can come through, we know oxygen and water vapor can come through as well. So this is kind of the benefit of testing a fully sealed package to understand what's my true ingress of gases into it. 